Okay, um, if we could bring in the jury. We now have our docket covered for next week. <laughs> That I was working on. Yeah, I don't know. Do we? There's 223 set for calendar calls, so I think something's going on, and that's tomorrow. So I had to get it resolved by today. I say 200, The world continues without. Nobody's indispensable. I'm operating on that theory. That's what I hear. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, it is what it is, right? Please be seated. Um, Mr. Moore, cross-examination. Dr. Sack, the uh, 25 times or so that you've estimated the potential spine is a witness. Is that then as a psychologist? Yes. And uh, what would be the breakdown of how many times of those you testified for the government, the state, or the federal government? Uh, I don't testify often, not called often by the um, state. I don't testify, I do, I mean, I don't testify a lot because I write clear reports and typically aren't called. I, I guess maybe. 15% of the time for what for the for the prosecution 50% of the prosecution that's federal and state yes and of the items that you reviewed uh, you mentioned what you did look at and, and your report didn't indicate that you had actually seen the DVD of the interrogation or had you I uh, guess yes Okay. I believe on both All right. And so the part that you saw of the, inter of the interrogation, Mr. Bradley, that began when the police went into the room and woke him up. Yes. And could you tell at that point whether he's asleep on or passed out or don't know one way or the other? I, I don't know one way or the other. And when you indicated that they picked him up off the floor, he was literally picked up off the floor, wasn't he? Yes. And, and would you say thrown in the chair? No, that definitely not. Gently placed Gently. in the chair. Is that when he sort of curled up in the fetal position? Is that the part? Yeah, I saw that uh, Dr. Olander had characterized it that way. I didn't see it that way. I saw them as help, like picking him up, and so his legs are, I assume, in leg irons, and so like he, they pick him up and put him on the chair. I didn't see any. But it pretty much, you know, got it right. Speaks for itself. Put your one's own spin, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. But all right. So, um, did, did you did? Uh, you correct me if I'm wrong, but you did not uh, consider the, the deposition testimony of Andrea Kirshner. Correct. And uh, the DVD of the actual shooting incident with comments of the defendant, which you heard in that. 
Right, I was to evaluate his uh, on a waiver of Miranda. I understand. Uh, the the uh, neuroimaging testing, the MRI, the PET scan, you did consider those reports as well? No, I did not. Is that something in determining an ability to uh, understand and knowingly and intelligently waive Miranda rights for talking about cognitive functioning? Yes. And you, would you not want to have that information in making such a determination if there is a positive indication of some sort of brain anomaly? I'm not going to go into all the problems with the scanning techniques. It's not my area of expertise. No, not typically. That is not uh, information that I would take into consideration. I'm a forensic psychologist. Okay, so a, a neuropsychologist, a psychologist, uh, are you saying that they should not rely on that if it's a qualified test that's done properly? Well, even neuropsychologists don't do scanning. So if somebody else no, no, no. would... Oh, I'm sorry. Maybe sorry, I'm misunderstanding. Clear. If you have that data, if you have a report done by a qualified physician who has done an MRI and interpreted it and also a PET scan and interpreted that, somebody who's qualified to do it and read it, would you want to consider that data in doing a, in a mental evaluation of the individual? Uh, not typically. Would you refuse to consider it? No. If you had it, what would you do? Uh, if I have it, I would probably get, seek outside, outside consultation to help me interpret that report and then use that as one piece of data along with all of the rest of the data that would be collected as part of that evaluation. Okay, and you, uh, you indicated you made reference to uh, the data that was gained by Dr. Olander in her face to face interview with Mr. Grant. And that was an opportunity to, among other things, uh, do a, an objective assessment through the Hill House and the other testing components, which indicate deception and malingering, and also do a face to face and evaluate the, the way the person responds and whether the person's attentive to the testing to see if the person is, is actually given the best effort. She had that data as well. So, what is the question? The face to face interview and the information that Dr. Olander gave from that. She, that's something you also did not have because you didn't interview Mr. Bradley. I wasn't there for her interview of Mr. Bradley. Or your own. Correct, or my own. And you did not see the approximately seven hours of Mr. Bradley sleeping or being passed out on the floor before the police came in, the police officers came in and woke him up and put him in the chair. Correct, I did not. Okay. And, and if in assessing the effects of the drugs on Mr. Bradley, is that something that you would not look at if you had it? No, I believe that information is in my report. I took into consideration the timeline. If he's just, if there's nothing active going on on the video, then there really isn't need for me to watch seven hours of him sleeping. Well, what if he's falling out of a chair? Would that be considered that to be active or maybe uh, informative of the extent to which he, he may be under the influence of drugs? And to some extent, perhaps, but I, I calculated timelines, so that's typically how it's done. But you really have to see it before you can assess what it is. I would mean, guess you decide whether it's significant or not. You have to see it. See what? See him. See Mr. Bradley's behavior. If he is having trouble with motor control, falling out of a chair, that sort of thing, I mean, is that something that you would have to see before you can assess what value you can place on it? Uh, it depends when it occurs. I'm evaluating competency to waive Miranda, so right at that time. You considered a face-to-face -face interview to be an important component of a mental, mental evaluation? Yes, I do. And would you consider that to be a component of uh, this assessment of Mr. Brown? Uh, for my purposes? It would have been nice to see Mr. Bradley to interview him, but um, I had the benefit of having all of Dr. Olander's testing and all of the records that I could review. So Now, with respect to her testing, um, there you had all the data, which included the, uh, the uh, Paul House deception scales and the, the advanced clinical solutions. Correct. Which both are instruments to gauge malingering or lack thereof. 
Uh, the pole house deception scale is a response style instruments so is gauged to, to give you information about how someone presents. And then the clinical solutions, those are other tests, but they have validity scale components to them, which uh, speak to someone's level of effort. And so that they both, they basically address uh, more or less a broad area of whether the person is is uh, given his best effort and given a, an accurate response, a, a truthful response uh, or deceptive response. Level of effort, yes. Accurate, truthful responses, not typically with those instruments. That would be the symptom validity testing that I spoke about. Dr. Olander's conclusion was that there was no deception or malingering or lack of effort indicated in either of those tests. Yes, that was her conclusion. And you didn't indicate in the report that you disagreed with <coughs> No, I don't disagree with that. I, I would not have submitted a report that didn't have symptom validity testing when the symptoms are the issue. And there were no indication in her notes, which you also had, which indicated her concern about his, his best effort. Uh, correct. No, no indication of concern about that. I noticed a number of instances throughout her notes where uh, he was able to complete all of the testing as required, but didn't meet the time limits. So that was why he would uh, fall shorter on the scoring for those instruments. And, and there's also a, a, um, a better word, a, a malingering or deception component for in the uh, Miranda Miranda test of the SAMA. The SAMA has a component, it's a new instrument relatively recently published that is um, the validity scale component. There is not, there's not a lot of research on that. Okay, okay. but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a tool which is recognized as uh, useful in making that assessment of whether the person is giving their best effort. Um, it's not used to determine whether someone's giving effort. Or being deceitful. Uh, it's looking for inconsistencies in their statements. Same, same, same sort of thing. You can look to see if the test results are valid uh, because the person, you know, or invalid because the person is um, maybe because of inconsistencies, not being honest or not being truthful or not trying. Yeah, I, I think of inconsistencies in terms of just inconsistent responding because they're careless or not paying attention or randomly responding. That's what it, that's what it typically gets at. The uh, Other the Grisso, which was an older version that Ms. Dr. Olander used. Yes. And you had no problem with that or using that. No, no problem. But you indicated that uh, SIRS is a gold standard. Uh, the SIRS looks at psychiatric symptomatology. So when someone's claiming to have uh, hallucinations or delusions or uh, being paranoid, whatever those symptoms are, the SIRS is what uh, looks at the validity of those symptoms. So is there is there some is there a rule or, or guideline which says that SIRS is preferable to the uh, uh, SAMA? They look at two different things. So the SIRS is looking solely at the validity of someone's symptoms, and the SAMA and the GRISO's instruments are looking at understanding, appreciation, and reasoning abilities within the context of waiving your Miranda rights. Okay, which were the essential components that both of you looked at determining whether he knowingly, voluntarily, intelligently waived. Correct. He was unimpaired on all of those instruments. But that, you don't just rely exclusively on those written tests. You, you consider the whole, uh, the whole presentation, which would include whether he's under the influence of uh, controlled substances, whether, I think, as you pointed out, you know, there was any external pressure from the police. You, know, you don't just stop with the test results of the GRISO and the, and the exam. Correct. Totality of the circumstances. Now, in that. And also the circumstances of the defendant's life that may come to bear on such issues as voluntariness. That, that you want to have that information as well, would you not? Uh, to some extent, although really looking at that particular point in time that the defendant waived his or her rights. Right, but you know, the defendant goes into, into an interrogation room with all of that, all those circumstances with him, and they have some, they potentially could have some effect. You want to know what effect it may have on his, whether he is acquiescing, for example. To, to authority figures. Yeah, typically when I watch an interrogation video, if something comes up that raises a red flag for me, then I'll seek out other information. So if something came up that would raise a red flag about life circumstances or whatever, then I might... Uh, I On the issue of voluntariness, further. if the defendant in its history 
indicated a fear of police and they uh, had experience in his life a number of friends who were killed or murdered. Uh, would that, and if that came, played, had an effect on his uh, acquiescence to authority figures, is that something you would want to know about and take into consideration? If that were the situation, I might want to consider that, but it did, there didn't appear to be anything in this situation that raised that in the interrogation video. Right, but not in the video itself, but it was some information that was derived from the face-to-face -face interview with Dr. Olander had with Mr. Bradley. Dr. Olander mentioned information in her report about uh, Mr. Bradley uh, witnessing or having several people close to him die. And and that the is a is fear of being shot as well. I don't have any information on fear of being shot. And he mentioned, uh, in fact, as he was sitting in the interrogation room, he was showing the the uh, deputies uh, tattoos of uh, that he had on his on his body, on body, I guess, his arm of the friends who had been murder victims. As he was showing what they're asking him, did he do it? Anybody been killed? Do you recall that? Uh, not specifically. Not that. of mental health records doesn't mean that there is no mental health history. Correct. And for a number of reasons, a person could have health issues lifelong and not come to the attention of anybody to keep a record of. Unusual, but possible. It could have something to do with socioeconomic status, where a person lives, cultural types of factors, could it not? Uh, it's possible. People who don't have a great deal of money are apt to seek out mental health services, or if they don't have education and know of these services, they're not going to seek them out either, right? I don't know that there's any research that explicitly makes that connection, but I, I heard Dr. Olander say it. I don't disagree. Mm -hmm. I don't have an opinion on the issue. And, and also, there would be a reluctance in some instances you to admit to having mental health issues in some certain some situations or circumstances with their Of course. Some people do, yes. Right. And so they you know they, they want people not to know that they have issues. Yes. And they may think that they would think the problems that they have are normal and there's not a problem at all. Uh, when you're hearing voices I don't know that I, I think I would maybe take issue with, with knowing with thinking that that's normal. Um, so typically when you have psychotic symptoms, then it comes to the attention of someone. Like I know Dr. Olander mentioned in his report or her report that um, teachers would, you know, comment to Mr. Bradley, who are you talking to, who are you listening to, what, you know, sort of seeing him have auditory hallucinations, which um, is very unusual, very atypical, and then to not have any mental health records, uh, also very unusual, quite atypical. The, the term auditory hallucination, you don't have any reason to believe that that's the term that Mr. Bradley used. Oh, no. I, I wouldn't expect that he used that term. And do you, you think it would be unusual for a, a kid to be talking to himself and the teacher comment on that uh, and, then, and, and not appear in a, um, a child's uh, school records? My understanding was that Mr. Bradley was claiming that he had auditory hallucinations from the age of 12 or 13, so it would be very unusual to not have any mention of that in any sort of record, mental health, school, or otherwise. Well, you know, put it in, in, in more realistic terms, he wasn't, as far as you know, he wasn't claiming that he was, I, Brandon Bradley, I'm having auditory hallucinations from the age of 12. I mean, he, no, those weren't the words coming out of his mouth. Uh, no, I believe the words coming out of his mouth were that he heard voices, saw UFOs, uh, saw his grandfather speaking to him who had passed, so those types of things. Uh, 
hearing voices would be the auditory hallucination part of that. Um, the visual hallucinations are even more unusual than auditory hallucinations, so that again would raise a red flag for me, especially with the absence, with the lack of mental health records. It would be quite atypical to have that severe of symptomatology and not have any record of it. Well, we don't know about number or frequency or the situation in which these uh, auditory hallucinations occur. We don't, you don't have that information. I, I don't have that information. In other words, we don't, we don't know how frequent that these things happen. They're happening all the time. You might expect it to find, find it in records, but if it just happens infrequently, then maybe less. It's unusual for it to happen infrequently. Do you, do you know for a fact that the Cobb County School Board and the Brevard County School Boards keep psychiatric records or mental health records of the children who are in, go through the, the school system in those respective counties? I don't know that for a fact if they keep those types of records. Or for I, how long? Uh, you don't know that? I don't know that. Okay. Um, and so if the records don't exist, it could be a function of if there are any records at all. Uh, of the school just not keeping them. Well, the school probably wouldn't have the mental health records. Like the school would have re records of their referral to mental health or problem. <coughs> Appreciation of rights. Uh, Dr. Olander indicated that Mr. Bradley had a, under the testing that he was given on an, an understanding of rights and, and, however, some difficulty in applying them. Do you recall her saying that? I recall her saying that, yes. And, and when, when, you're, when you were talking about seeing the DVD and, and coming to the conclusion that he had an appreciation of, of uh, the, the significance of giving a confession. Uh, and you, what you pointed to was Mr. Bradley saying, I'm uh, concerned for my baby mama, for my girlfriend, and, uh, and I don't want her getting in trouble. Within the context of being case. very specific about the gun and how the gun was obtained and whose gun it was. So but he didn't express any concern about his own, you know, himself getting in trouble. He didn't express that same concern with respect to the criminal difficult is that he may be. Uh, no, he didn't express concern about incriminating himself. He kind of talked about 20 years versus 30 years. Like, if he gives this information, you know, it may add to his time. But. Would, would that suggest that if, if he knew that he'd been there for shooting and killing a law enforcement officer, that maybe he doesn't have a handle on the, the trouble that he's in, and he's thinking, well, 30 years, 20, 20 30 years, so that suggests that maybe he doesn't have a complete appreciation of the criminal problems that you may be facing? No, not at all. Just the opposite to me. It suggests that he has a handle on it. If he thinks that he's going to be out or he's going to get off or it's going to be a short period of time, that would raise a red flag for me, 20, 30 years. Don't you think if somebody, you know, were, you know was faced with a charge like that, he might be thinking death penalty and then really have a more realistic grasp of the trouble he's in? I don't know. I can't. I don't know. And uh, I, I don't know whether I asked you this, but, but the other item, items that you, one of the other items you did not consider was the toxicology report of Dr. Scully. Correct, I did not. Did not I am not a toxicologist. So then, and that's you know, the fact that there may be controlled substances in his blood <laughs> at the time of the waiver of Miranda would not be something that you would uh, consider. Right, I did consider it. You saw in my report, I'm sure, that I mentioned, that I sort of put together the timelines that he'd been taken into custody around noon, that he was interrogated, waived his Miranda rights around 7.30. So I assume, I'm making the assumption that he didn't take any substances while he was in police custody. He'd been in police custody for about eight hours before the waiver of Miranda. So any substances that were in his body were in there for at least eight hours unless 
somehow he took substances during that time. He's also a chronic substance user, as documented by the all of the paperwork, um, which to me then, in terms of totality of the circumstances, chronic drug users metabolize quicker, it leaves their system quicker, the effects don't last as long or aren't as significant. So all of that kind of was taken into consideration in making my final opinion. Well, that's it indicates quite a bit of knowledge of toxicology. I would think we would want to have that report to consider. Uh, I'm not a toxicologist, so I don't really understand necessarily the amounts of times and you know whether bloods were taken at various points in time. I know that I, I know about how long substances last, at, you know, in terms of the intoxicating effects, and that's basically the extent of my knowledge. And in fact, uh, while Mr. Bradley has been in jail, um, you, you've indicated you would look for cooperation, would like to see cooperation of hallucinations, auditory and visual hallucinations. Uh, the fact is, while he's been in jail, he has been given psychotropic medications, doxepin and, and uh, risperdone, correct? Yeah, offenders are given psychotropic medications all the time and don't necessarily have the symptoms. So my job as a forensic psychologist is to tease apart what's, what's going on with, you know, other stuff like you, you reviewed the book, the book, Correctional Institute Records. I did, record. yes. And there was an indication in there of statements of hallucinations and delusions. Uh, no delusions. September 11th, 2012, Mr. Bradley claims to have auditory hallucinations, hear voices. It's the first time it's ever come up. And and he's automatically given a diagnosis of psychosis not otherwise specified, which means that they don't really have a good handle, but there's some psychotic symptoms that are being claimed. Uh, there's no indication in the record of anyone observing him uh, reacting to internal stimuli, uh, and then he is prescribed medication for those psych psychotic symptoms that he's claiming. You're, you're familiar with the, those two medications, risperdone and doxin. Uh, I know that they are uh, antipsychotics, and I know doxepin is an antipsychotic used to treat in insomnia, which I know that uh, the records indicate Mr. Bradley had been suffering from. And doxepin is also a, treat a treatment for depression and anxiety, right? Uh, I believe so. And risperdone for treatment of schizophrenia, hallucinations, would that be voices and images, delusions, uh, which would be untrue beliefs, those are nice things. That it's is also the treatment. That it, for which that medication is. Yes, it's an atypical antipsychotic. That's prescribed for those symptoms, correct? Correct. And he was on those? Well, he was prescribed those medications, right. yes. And that was prescribed by a medical doctor? Yes. A psychiatrist? I'm not sure. Not sure. MD of some sort. Somebody who is qualified to make a diagnosis and prescribe medication? Yes. Who had contact with Mr. Bradley? Hopefully more than minimal, which is typical in the jail. But, but yes. you don't know. I don't know. And you didn't confer with the doctor who prescribed this. So I you don't know not. how long he spent or, or what informed his decision to, to uh, uh, prescribe these medications. Correct. I do not. No further, no further questions. Can we direct on behalf of the state? Doctor, um, during your career, have you had an opportunity to review school records? Yes, I have. And school, school records. And school rec the records that you reviewed, do they typically contain uh, comments and or referrals when there's been claims of any, of any psychotic episodes? Yeah, the records typically don't contain PHI, personal health information. There's a a law that kind of keeps that separate. Uh, so typically you wouldn't see those records in there, but you would definitely see referrals and notes by the school board, teachers, whatever, uh, indicating that the child has, you know, some sort of problem is being referred to psychologist, psychiatrist. Um, so you typically see those types of referral notes. And uh, typically when a court order is made for requesting school records, they'll indicate, you know, please also include any other psychological assessments or records that are included. And then when that happens, typically those uh, psychological records that are kept separate are also, are also sent. And in this particular case, did you review all the records from Florida as well as Georgia school records? Yeah, Brevard County and Cobb County. Uh, Cobb County, Georgia, and Brevard County, Florida school records. 
And did you see anything in there, any indication, any comments, any referrals whatsoever? No. Or any psychotic history? No, no indication at all. Now, concerning the uh, defendant's prescription at the jail, uh, that occurred after he made this first-time claim of the uh, hallucinations? Uh, yes. He first made a claim of auditory hallucinations on September 11th, 2012. And then in December, he's prescribed uh, those two antipsychotic medications. So that's December 2012? Correct. My understanding is that he refused medication in September when he first started claiming auditory hallucinations. Now, um, concerning your review in this case, you did review the DVD of the defendant's interview. I did. Right. And it's listed on your report on page two that you have reviewed it? Yes. And is that one of the key things that you, uh, in this case, that you looked at to determine uh, the defendant's voluntariness of his waiver of Miranda? Yeah, typically when you conduct an interview of a defendant for purposes of, you know, their competence to waive Miranda, you're conducting the interview right now and looking at their competency at some earlier point in time when they waive Miranda. In this circumstance, there's actually an interrogation DVD. So uh, instead of using the interview for a proxy of what was going on at the time, you actually get to see what was going on at the time. So I, I paid close attention to that and outlined it in my report. So if that was missed somewhere, I, I apologize. And is among the facts that you talked about earlier on direct examination, looking at that interview, are his ability to recall times, uh, for instance, the length of time from the motel to the shooting, um, his discussion of the gun, where it came from, and all sorts of things. Does that all come into play in your decision on whether he's knowingly and voluntarily waiving his Miranda rights? Yeah, every statement that he makes, I'm trying to tie it back to understanding, appreciation, which is the application of understanding factual information to your, his own circumstance, and then reasoning or rational ability. If he's weighing information, if he's um, using any information that's not based in reality, that's delusional or incorrect, and so I'm trying to look at all of that to make a determination of whether whether he has an understanding, whether he has an appreciation, whether he um, is able to make decisions and weigh information in a, in a rational manner. And did you see anything on that video that would indicate to you that due to drug intoxication, he was unable to make those types of decisions? Uh, at the, no, at the beginning of the video, he's placed in his chair, he's just being woken up, so he's, he's groggy, and you know, there's, um, he's kind of, not stumbling because he's sitting, but he's kind of, you know, groggy. He's coming to. But when I look at the...